atheist? I am definitely an atheist, yes. Now, why are you an atheist? Why am I an atheist? Because there is no God. Atheism assumes that you can disprove the existence of a God. Uh, agnostic is a more correct term, but I'm an atheist. Are you an atheist? Uh, yeah. I am an atheist, yeah. I am, yes. I am. So you're not an atheist? Uh, no. I'm not. So you're leaning that way because of evolution? Yeah. I don't believe in the, there's a guy in the sky that lives in the sky. You believe in evolution? Of course I do, yes. Live science says of Darwinian evolution, it can turn dinosaurs into birds, apes into humans, and amphibious mammals into whales. What Darwin showed in his work on evolution and natural selection is that we don't need to invoke any supernatural force or power to account for the development of life through time on Earth. The ongoing processes that, that are observable in today's world. You think it's a belief? I think it's just fact. I think more like facts. There is too much evidence to ignore. Do you think it's a belief? No, it's science. It's the way it happened. It's logical. You know, all the scientists pretty much agree with it. It's, it's more of a fact. When did you start to believe? Um, when I started to think for myself. When did you start believing? Uh, when I took my first biology class. It all started to make a lot of sense. The teacher made it very, very easy to understand. I generally trust the scientific community. It makes more sense than any religion or anything. The fossils they found of all the all the cavemen, the homo sapiens, the dinosaurs, it shows clear evidence. I believe in science. What's your major here at this university? Biology. Your biology major? Yeah. You believe in evolution? Yes. What's your major? Geology. Chemistry? Biochemistry. Environmental science and policy. I'm a physicist. Biochemistry. Hey, do you believe in evolution? Uh, yes, I do. Do you believe in evolution? Yes, I do. Of course. Yes, I do. I do believe in evolution. Do you believe in evolution? Yes. Are you a strong believer? Yes. Are you a strong believer? Yep. Uh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. A scientific method is based on the collection of data through observation and experimentation. Science Daily. Could you give me some observable evidence that evolution is true. Uh, something I don't have to uh, receive by faith. Yeah. Some observable evidence. I mean, take a look at what happened 65 million years ago. Hang on, I can't. That's 65 million years ago. I believe, t yeah, millions of years. So that can't be observed. We can trace the evolution through the fossil record. Could you be specific? Just give me one. Um, uh, between six and seven million years ago. Hundreds of thousands to millions of years? So it's quite a long time. Yes. Millions of years. Yes. So it can't be observed. Evolution is, is not testable over time. We are condemned to live only for a few decades, and that's too slow, too small a time scale to see evolution going on. Richard Dawkins. We see nothing of these slow changes in progress until the hand of time has marked the lapse of ages. Charles Darwin. You've got the canine kind, the coyote, and the domestic dog, and there's the feline kind, which is the cat, the tiger and the kitten, and you've got humankind. So Darwin said there'd be a change of kinds over many years, so could you give me one example of observable ex evidence of a change of kinds? So for instance, the fossil record shows the common ancestors of all carnivores, that cats and dogs were once linked, once united by a common ancestor. How long ago? Uh, this, I believe, was like 60 million years ago. I don't want something I have to accept by faith. I want it to be observable. Observable evidence. Well, I mean, if you're just asking me here on the street, there's not really much I can tell you in terms of observable evidence. Like, we would have to really examine existing data to draw conclusions of our own. I would have to have faith in... We would have to have some amount of faith. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution? Where he said there'd be a oh, change like of kinds. A monkey to a man, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, a change of kinds. I don't really believe there's any proof for that yet. Well, monkeys are the only ones with the fifth digit, like we have. Well, koalas have a fifth digit. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Think we're evolved from koalas? No. When I went to like Washington DC, I saw the they had a whole exhibit just on the In the Smithsonian? Yeah, in the Smithsonian. Oh wait, so that is just like some stuffed dummies, yeah. like standard men of fire. I know that everyone talks about the missing link for humans and whatnot. I believe that there are connections that are out there that we haven't found yet. I'm gonna trust what those experts did. 
those experts uh, came up with. I have a strong trust in evolutionary ideas based on the evidence presented. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds? I haven't seen it myself, but I believe what the textbooks tell me about it, so. so you've got faith in the expert? I have faith in the experts, yeah. I guess similar to how religious people have faith that God actually exists, I have faith in the experts knowing what they're talking about. The scientific method is, must be observable and repeatable, so could you give me one piece of observable evidence for Darwinian evolution? Okay, I would point to, as one great example is, look at the genetics of the stickleback. What's that? Uh, so stickleback fish are a very interesting collection of species that were recently isolated after the end of the Ice Age. What have they become? They're, they're various species of sticklebacks. They stayed as fish? Well, of course. Can you think of any observable evidence where there was a change of kinds? Fish. Human beings are still fish. Human beings are fish? Why, yes, of course they are. How long did that take? A couple of billions of years, millions. A couple of millions? How is that observable? It's not. We came out of the ground as a mammal, and one mammal created... Come out of the ground? Didn't we come out of the sea? Huh? Well, initially in the beginning, we came out of the ground and the sea. After the great destruction of the... the... So do we have lungs or gills when we came out of the sea? You want to know something? Those that were in the sea, I guess, had gills, and those that were on land had lungs. But if we came out of the sea, we had you gills in the sea. You want to know something? Who knows that we came out of the sea or we came out, we evolved from mammals? So you don't know? Huh? Of course I don't know. I'm accepting that they did their science correctly. Could you give me an example of Darwinian evolution, not adaptation or speciation, but a change of kinds? <laughs> These are changes of kinds. They're still fish they're distinctly different fish. We have thousands of examples. Give me, can say, you give me one? I can give you, I can give you thousands, just one. one. For instance, I would say, uh, look at Lenski's experiments with bacteria then. So what do the bacteria become? The bacteria are still bacteria, of course. So that's not Darwinian evolution. That's not a change of kinds, is it? It, it is a change, it is a change in the genetic makeup of the bacteria, which but is still bacteria. So what do the bacteria become? Uh, a new kind of bacteria. It's still bacteria, there's no change of kinds. To summarize, the observable evidence that you give me for Darwinian evolution is bacteria becoming bacteria. No, it is bacteria acquiring new metabolic capabilities. You said before that there, are, there is lots of evidence for evolution. I just want one observable evidence for Darwinian evolution, yeah, no, just one. But I gave you some, you don't want... Not some, I want one. Wait, you don't want that. That's I want one. Said, yes, I do, I'm pleading no, with you people. Said, you asked me to tell you, you asked me to tell you when I've watched one species evolve into another, isn't that right? No, one kind into another. There's 14, is it 14 different definitions of species? So I want a change of kind. When you're talking about kinds or change in families, you're, you're actually talking about, about macroevolution. You're talking about um, uh, changes on the level of, that separate, say, cats from dogs. So could you give me any examples of Darwinian evolution? Well, when you say examples of that, then you have to sort of look at over a longer time frame. It has nothing to do with faith. Faith is something that I have to, unseen, I have to believe in. That's it, unseen. Look, right. do you believe evolution? Of course I do. Are you a believer in evolution? Yes, I am. When did you start to believe evolution? I started to believe evolution when I started to think out for myself. Is evolution a belief? Evolu evo well, you know something, evolution is a is a thought process, is, is coming to terms and, and, and checking out all the, alterna all the alternatives, like uh, taking a look at the, the religion, man-made religions. Let me ask you again, is evolution a belief? No, evolution is, well, yeah, in a, in a word, yeah, I could say it, it could be a belief. When you say change of kinds, you mean the evolution of one species from another or to another? Yes, we have that in action, actually, in the Galapagos. Could you give me one instance? Yes, we have an example from a group of birds called Darwin's finches. And you take a look at the difference between the finches on the islands that all started out. I mean, that's very, very observable. But that's not Darwinian evolution. There's been no change of kinds. What do the finches become? They become genetically new and anatomically new, recognizably different species. So they're still finches? Well, of course they're still finches, yes. So they're not a change of, there's no change of kind. Little birds that he, uh, that he had observed that... Oh, what did they become? Um... Their beaks, their beak shapes. They're their still colors. birds. 
Yes. Three finches that turn into different types of birds. They're still the finches. Well, for example, Darwin and, and his study on evolution of uh, the birds on the island that he went on to there. Their beaks changed? Their beaks. Uh, but they're still birds. There's no change of kinds. That's within no, no, no. the kind. It's evolution on the beaks. That's so that's called adaptation. It's not Darwinian evolution. There's no change of kinds. There's no different animal involved. I want something that shows me Darwin's belief in a change of kinds is scientific. Darwin spoke of a change of kind. Can you think of any observable evidence for Darwinian evolution where there's a change of kind? Uh, <laughs> change of kind. Change of kind. Uh, I'm going to have to think about that one a little longer. You give me anything that I can see, observe, and test, which is a scientific method for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds. Test and observe. Could you give me observable evidence, which is a scientific method for Darwinian evolution, a change of kinds? about it. <laughs> um, so you want the evidence of it? I would say... I cannot, I think. Um, hmm. Hard question, actually. Mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so, can you repeat the question again? Could you give me any observable evidence, just one, for Darwinian evolution? Uh, let me think about that for a sec. Um, hmm. okay. Observable evidence, something where we don't have to exercise faith something that can be observed, like the scientific process, observable? Hmm, that's a good question. That one I'm not quite sure. So you can't think of any observable evidence for evolution? No. How do you know it's true? Hmm. I'm not sure. So Darwinian evolution is not observable, it's not scientific? I guess so. So it's unscientific, you can't prove it. It's scientific, actually. You could prove it, it could be proven, just... Do it for me. Ah, that's hard. I don't got, I don't, it's just, that's just too broad of a... Of it's unobservable. That's why you need millions of years. Yes, exactly. Where? You're trusting the biology majors and the biology professors know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, and they can't even give me a, they can't even give me evidence of a change of kinds. Well, I'm, well then there isn't one. If they don't give it, then I don't, I wouldn't say there was. Yeah. I just go on what I've seen and what I've learned from class. So you believe? Yeah. You know what that's called? What? Blind faith. Blind faith. <laughs> Faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Richard Dawkins. Do you believe in intelligent design? Of course not. Do you think everything is intelligently designed? Um, no, I don't believe that things are intelligently designed. Okay, you seem like an intelligent person, so I'm going to ask you something. I'd like you to make me a rose, okay? How would you make a rose? I don't have the, the, the capabilities to do no, that. Hang on. No, it's not intelligently designed, so you should be able to whip me up a rose real quick. Do you believe a rose is intelligently designed? Definitely not. In order for me to know what to make, I have to know what a rose is. Well, it's got a seed, so you've got to start with nothing and you've got to create a seed from nothing. Oh. Can you do that? No, I can't. Could you make a rose from nothing? No. You can't make like, something from nothing. It's it's just basic, you know, science. A rose from nothing? A rose. Just like, I, I can't, honestly. Why not? Me, I just, I have no supernatural abilities. All the geniuses in the world can't make a grain of sand from nothing. We don't know where to start. I can't. Why not? I don't have millions, billions of years. Uh, that would be physically impossible. I mean, I would have to, th that's, that's not possible. So how could you say everything is not intelligently designed? Where does that leave you on the scale of intelligence if you say everything is not intelligently designed and you can't even make a rose? Why do you think there's no one teaching intelligent design at UCLA? Because they're not allowed to. 
We can teach anything we want. There's a reason intelligent design isn't taught in our learning institutions. According to physicist Victor Stinger, the legal staff of Freedom From Religion Foundation, a church-state watchdog group, has had remarkable success in convincing many institutions, such as school boards and town councils, that they are breaking constitutional law when they sponsor sectarian activities. That includes intelligent design. When the authorities can't be convinced, Freedom From Religion Foundation sues, and it wins more often than not. There was nothing in the beginning, big explosion of nothing, it became something and then it came into a rose and giraffes and horses and cows. Well, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that that's what happened. I'm just saying I don't know what happened. And that's what, that's what, that's what scientists are, are, are have theorized has happened. And you believe them? To a point. So you've got faith? That is true, yeah. Could you give me a definition of vestigials? How's that back up evolution? Vestigial is, uh, is like, I'm not a biologist, so I'm kind of fuzzy here, but it's, it's like a remaining organ that is not used, like for instance, our appendix. Uh, rabbits have huge appendix for digestion of grass. We still have a vestigial appendix. Or the appendix has no use? Which we can think of right now. Your uh, coccyx bone, that was, you know, many people regard that as the tail of the humans. The human tailbone is said to be vestigial. That is, it's an evolutionary leftover proving that we're related to primates. However, it's not a tailbone, it's the coccyx vertebrae. The tailbone derived its name because some people believe it's a leftover part from human evolution, though the notion that the tailbone serves no purpose is wrong. The coccyx is an extremely important source of attachment for tendons, ligaments, and muscles. Evolutionists also claim that the appendix is vestigial, but it's not. The appendix is actually part of the human immune system. According to Scientific American, for years, the appendix was credited with very little physiological function. We now know, however, that the appendix serves an important role in the fetus and in young adults. Among adult humans, the appendix is now thought to be involved primarily in the immune functions. I would consider myself an atheist, yeah. Can you think of any famous atheists? Uh, I believe um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil deGrasse Tyson said, I can't agree to the claims by atheists that I'm one of that community. Can you name a few? Uh, famous atheists. Uh, apparently not. Oh, start with Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton said, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Can you think of any famous atheists? Yeah, no. A famous atheist. Yeah, a famous atheist. Yeah, my dad. <laughs> He's not famous. <laughs> Skeptics' websites often include examples of famous atheists in an attempt to win converts. But more often than not, the famous personalities cited are not actually atheists. This is a popular atheist poster on which are Ernest Hemingway, Abraham Lincoln, Carl Sagan, Mark Twain, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein and Charles Darwin, along with the words, atheism, good enough for these idiots. Clearly, atheism is for intellectuals. But one moment, Abraham Lincoln wasn't an atheist. He said, I know that the Lord is always on the side of the right, but it's my constant anxiety and prayer that I and this nation should be on the Lord's side. Neither was Carl Sagan. He clearly stated, I am an agnostic. Mark Twain hated religion, but he certainly wasn't an atheist, saying, none of us can be as great as God, but any of us can be as good. Benjamin Franklin said, God governs in the affairs of men. You'll find Thomas Edison listed on celebrity atheists, on positive atheism, and other atheist websites, but he wasn't an atheist. He said, there is a great directing head of people and things, a supreme being who looks after the destinies of the world. Thomas Jefferson said, say nothing of my religion. It is known to myself and my God alone. Albert Einstein rejected the Bible as the word of God and said that the creator was unknowable and that God being personal was childlike. He lamented, in view of such harmony in the cosmos, which I, with my limited human understanding, am able to recognize, there are yet people who say there is no God. Well, what really makes me angry is that they quote me to support such views. He categorically said, I am not an atheist. And when referring to those who deny the creator, he used the term fanatical atheists. 
Charles Darwin said, I have never been an atheist. So out of the eight famous men on the poster, there was only one who was an atheist, Ernest Hemingway. According to his biographer, back in 1961, Hemingway, quote, pushed two shells into the 12 gauge Boss shotgun, put the end of the barrel into his mouth, pulled the trigger and blew out his brains. There's your poster boy when it comes to atheism. Keep in mind that even though some of these men claim to believe in God, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're believers in the one true creator revealed in the scriptures or that they're genuine Christians. However, when atheists use theists or agnostics to promote their godless agenda, they're being dishonest. Then again, coming from those who claim that morality is relative to each person, convenient dishonesty should not be a surprise. Do you believe in moral absolutes? Uh, no, I do not. Is rape wrong? Rape is wrong in our culture, yes. And it is rape always wrong? Uh, it depends on your beginnings. If you say that you have a respect for other human beings, then yes, rape is always wrong. So there are moral absolutes. Is rape absolutely wrong? In my opinion, it is. So who makes the rules? We do. So if Hitler made the rules and he had the majority? If Hitler made the rules, yes, we would be living in a society that uh, Hitler would consider moral, but which I would not consider moral. Did Hitler put into practice survival of the fittest? No. What was he doing then? He was murdering people. But that's survival of the fittest? Yeah, that's not survival of the fittest. It is. It's the lion eating the antelope. Uh, no, there's much more to evolution than just this kind of crude kill and be killed model that you have in your head. But I have seen a, a quote from Richard Dawkins saying evolution in its rawest is incredibly cruel. It is. Yes. That was Hitler putting evolution into practice. Uh, that does not mean it was moral. Nobody it was immoral. Uh, nobody's claiming that evolution is a moral process. Evolution is a very harsh and cruel process. Do you believe in evolution? Yes, I do. You have a dog? Yes. Love your dog? I do love my dog. Yes, I do. I love animals. Okay. Well, your pet dog and your rotten neighbor are drowning. You'd only save one of them. Who would you save? Hmm. That is a tough one. You'd only save one? Mm -hmm. Why are you hesitating? Oh, I think I would save my dog. I don't, I don't know why I'm really hesitating. Because, I don't know, I feel, like, I feel like people would see me as a bad person if I said the dog. Mm, I'll save my dog. So, is your neighbor not worth saving? Well, he's not worth saving more than my dog is. I'd go with the dog. Yeah. I mean, you, you would want to save the animal, so I would want to, I would want to save my dog. If well, we're animals. I believe we're all equal. I don't think humans have, like, a higher, like, place. So you think uh, dogs are more valuable than human beings? Do you believe in evolution? Yes, I do. I so do. it's just a matter of survival of the fittest. Your neighbor's a, a primate, and you've got a canine, and you like the canine more than you like the primate. Would that be right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it's survival of the fittest. I mean, um, survival of the fittest? Yeah, pretty much. You said you believe in evolution. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of survival of the fittest. Yeah. If he drowns, he drowns. Big yeah. deal. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is true. <laughs> Are you an atheist? Uh, yeah. Any fetus is less human than an adult pig. Richard Dawkins. So you don't think God exists? Um, more like I know. Are you comfortable talking about spiritual things? I don't know much about them because they're not really capable of knowledge. Once we're dead, we stop that. We stop. How that. do you know? Because it's just it's just what the facts are. Like when if if you stopped breathing right now, you'd be considered dead. Jacob, if you were a car and your motor got turned off, that'd be right. That's inanimate. But you're a living, biological human being with a life of God in you. We are a mechanical being because we have different parts that. Is work. there no life in you? Yes, there's life in me. That's your soul. Okay, can you handle some questions? They're pretty pointed questions. Sure. Are you a good person? Are you going to make it to heaven? Um, I would like to think so. Do I think I'm a good person? Yeah. Are you a good person, morally? Yes, I am. Do you think you're a good person? Yes. I, I like to believe so, yeah. How many lies have you told in your whole life? I wouldn't be able to count. I don't know if I can remember. Can you be honest with me? Yeah. How many lies do you think you've told in your whole life? Oh, quite a few. Countless. Uncountable. What would you call me if I told lots of lies? Countless lies. You'd call me a liar, wouldn't you? Of course. What do you call someone who's told thousands of lies? A liar. So what are you? I'm a liar. Have you ever stolen something in your whole life, even if it's small? Yes, I have. Have you ever taken something that belonged to someone else? Of course. Sure. 
Yes, I have. It's called theft. So what are you? A liar and a thief. I'm a liar and a thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Oh, every day. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Oh, all the time. Have you ever used God's name in vain? It's probably so. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yep. I have indeed. It's called blasphemy. It's very serious to use God's name as a cuss word. I don't believe in blaspheming since I don't believe in God. So if you don't believe in God, how can you blaspheme? Well, if I don't believe in certain laws and still violate them, ignorance of the law is no excuse. So we're still guilty even though we deny a law exists or we even don't know about it. One to go and appreciate your honesty, Jacob. Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Why, yes, I look at many women with lust in my heart. Of course. Have you ever looked at a guy with lust? With lust? Lust. Oh, yeah. Sure. Not recently. I have indeed. Are you having sex outside of marriage? <laughs> no, not yet. Are you looking at pornography? Yes. You're lusting after women, see? Of course. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Absolutely. So, Peter, by your own admission, you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterate heart. And that's only four of the Ten Commandments. What I'm saying to you is just not believing in hell doesn't make it go away. A judge must see that justice is done if he's a good judge, and it's the same with God. If we die in our sins, God will give us justice. The Bible says no thief, no liar, no fornicator, no blasphemer, no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. So, Julia, if you died in your sins and God gave you justice because he's holy and perfect morally, you'd end up in hell, and I'd hate that to happen to you. Man, would you sell one of your eyes for a million dollars? Probably not, no. Both for a hundred million? No, I value seeing too much. So see how precious your eyes are to you, how much more precious is your life? And you're saying, I don't care if I get damned from all that which is good. Of course you care. You've got a will to live. Now let me tell you something you know intuitively. You know that creation is proof of the Creator. God's given you that light. Proof of the Creator. Yes, we do. We don't, actually. Inside story, I have, a, I, have a, I have a whistleblower and it tells me that you know God exists, and the reason you choose evolution is because it gets rid of moral accountability. Evolution... It does not get rid of moral accountability. It does. It means you, your primal instincts, lust and pornography and fornication, adultery, all just primal instincts. That's all. You're just an animal. The Bible demands moral accountability and says those things are wrong, and that's why it's not acceptable to you. That's why you're not seeking after truth. Am I wrong? <sighs> Am I wrong? I don't... I think you're wrong. I say that you know intuitively that creation is proof of the Creator. God has given you that inner light. So when you look at the genius of God's creative hand, you know He exists because of creation. You are a unique human being made in the image of God with a sense of justice and truth and righteousness. God gave you a conscience. It's inherent. and shaped by society, but it's inherent. You know right from wrong. You have violated His law, and I don't want you to end up in hell. James, if you put your finger on it and see if we can, your struggle at the moment is because of your love of sin, because of the pleasure that sin gives you and you don't want to give it up. You're like a man with a, a money belt filled with gold who's just fallen into the ocean. And I'm saying, if you don't get rid of that belt that weighs 80 pounds, it's going to take you under. It doesn't matter how much pleasure it gives you, it's not worth losing your life for. Gail, you're not a beast. You are a human being created by God in His image with dignity and worth and purpose. Now, do you know what God did for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Any idea? Mm -mm. No. Well, God became a human being 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth, and he suffered and died on a cross, taking the punishment for the sin of the world. You and I violated God's law, and Jesus paid our fine. That means God can legally dismiss our case because of the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Savior. God can say you're out of here because someone paid your fine. And then what God can now do is clothe us in the righteousness of Christ. So on Judgment Day, you're saved from God's wrath and his justice because of the death and resurrection of the Savior. If you repent and trust in him, God will give you a righteous standing in his eyes. He'll wash away your sins in an instant. And he'll grant you the gift of everlasting life. His last words on the cross were, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. He came to take our punishment upon himself. So because our fine was paid by another, God can legally dismiss your case. It's very hard to believe that someone would be willing to pay off the debts that's not his own. As in, yeah, well, the Bible says God is love. Yes. You know, and He's kind and generous and, and merciful. And in His great kindness, He became a human being and suffered for us. Does that make sense? Makes sense, yeah. How old are you? I'm 22. When are you going to die? I have no idea. Well, God knows exactly the moment of your death. And it could be tonight, it could be tomorrow. I'm not using scare tactics, this is just straight reality. 150,000 people every 24 hours die. And they're all making plans for next week, no doubt. 
So please think about this. Do you have a Bible at home? No. I'm not talking about a religion that says you've got to strive to get to heaven. I'm telling you the Bible says heaven is a free gift of God. You cannot earn everlasting life. Doesn't matter how religious you are, how good you are. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then he rose from the dead and defeated death. And this is how the Bible puts it. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. So eternal life is a free gift of God, and it comes because of God's mercy, not because of anything we do. Make sense? Yeah, makes sense. Do you have a Bible at home? Yep, yes. I've been reading the Bible every day for more than 40 years. There's no mistakes in it, Mike. Any mistakes that we think are our mistakes. And you can trust God's Word. I mean, think of how you trust professors and science books that tell you you're a, you're a primate. You trust and believe that. So how much more should you trust a God who cannot lie? Let me show you how fallible we are. Spell the word shop. 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 S-H-O-P. What do you do when you come to a green light? Stop. Green light. Huck. <laughs> so we're all fallible. We make mistakes. So imagine if you're making a mistake when you say this whole of creation came together because some explosion of nothing that produced everything, seasons, the birds, the trees, the flowers, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the marvels of the human body. So are you going to think about this? Oh, yeah, no, I, I think about this quite a lot, believe me. My brother, like I said, he's a hardcore Christian. He's going to Yale Divinity School right now, so he talks to me about this all the time. And so you've got to think seriously about this. Life is full of decisions. Soften your heart. Don't have so much blind faith in what science tells you and it's left you without any knowledge of what was in the beginning anyway. You haven't got a clue where you come from. You don't know what you're doing here on Earth, and you don't know what happens after you, after you die. Peter, uh, could you be wrong about God's existence? Yes, and could you be wrong about God's existence? No. Well. Then, then I think you're rather close-minded. Well, if I said to you, um, could you be wrong about your wife's existence, you'd say, no, I know her. You'd say, don't be ridiculous, I know her and love her. And I know the Lord and I love the Lord and He transformed my life 41 years ago, instantly, overnight, forgave my sins and gave me new desires when I had no desires or thoughts of God for the whole 22 years before I was a Christian. Mike, thanks for talking to me, I appreciate it. Yeah, of course, no problem, thank you. One more thing, because you're a very intelligent man, spell the word shop. Shop? Like S-H-O-P? S-H-O-P? What do you do when you come to a green light? You stop. Green light. Hmm? Green light. Oh. Ah, ha, ha. Very good. Here you go. Peter, you've been a good sport. Thank you very much for talking to me. Okay. I generally don't engage creationists because it's not good for my blood pressure. So you're going to think about this? Mm-hmm. I, I, I think about it a lot, actually. Like I, I think about I think about death and how fragile life is, and how just in a second I, it, it could all be over and there'd be nothing. You know, the the problem with those who are unable to see evolution, I think, is they don't have imaginations. Anatomical clues to human evolution from fish. Human beings are still fish. Human ears evolved from ancient fish gills. We came out of the ground as a mammal. Heavier dinosaur arms led evolution to birds. Do you think we're related to pigs? Do you think we've got a common ancestor in pigs? Yes. Proof that fearsome T-Rex evolved into a chicken. Do you think you're a primate? Yes, I am. Are you a talking primate? I am. Are you a cousin of bananas? Why, yes. When whales walked the land. I'm accepting that they did their science correctly. I generally trust the scientific community. I'm gonna trust what those experts did, those experts uh, came up with. Darwinian evolution rests on faith. And once again, according to Richard Dawkins, faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Darwinian evolution requires great faith. The knowledge of God, however, is clearly seen by all mankind. But since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Thank you for taking the time to watch Evolution vs. God. If you'd like to get more information about our ministry, please visit livingwaters.com. Ray Comfort has written a number of books on atheism and evolution to help further your study on this incredibly important subject. At livingwaters.com, you can also learn about our online school of biblical evangelism, our international television program, The Way of the Master, our daily webcast, The Comfort Zone, 
and Roots, a DVD series with Ray, Kirk Cameron, and the Duggar family. We're extremely humbled to see how God has used our previous productions to impact people around the globe and to spread the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to get free DVD copies of Evolution vs. God into the hands of university students across the world. To discover how you can help make this happen, please check out livingwaters.com. Thank you so much for partnering with us to inspire and equip Christians in fulfilling the Great Commission. The acclaimed Creation Museum and Outreach of Answers in Genesis is a -a one-of-a-kind museum filled with animatronic characters, interactive videos, a spectacular planetarium, a special effects theater, and many other world-class exhibits. Since its opening in 2007, the Creation Museum has welcomed over 1.5 million guests at its 49-acre location in the greater Cincinnati area. The -the state-of-the-art 70,000-square-foot museum brings the pages of the Bible to life, helping answer the skeptical questions that cause people to doubt that the Bible is true. The dramatic finale of the museum is the Last Adam film, where guests experience the glory of God's redemptive plan and hear a clear and powerful presentation of the gospel message. Since the museum's opening, we have heard countless testimonies from adults and young people whose lives have been changed through a museum visit. Now discover how it might change your own life for Christ. Plan your visit at creationmuseum.org and prepare to believe.